I will be talking about Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power, which was an exhibition that I co-curated last year at Tate Modern that you can see just down there. But I'm going to start quite a lot longer ago, sometime in the mid-80s, around 1985 in fact, when my father took me to a show at what was then the Tate Gallery called 40 Years of Modern Art. It was one of the first exhibitions I'd been taken to. And uh, what intrigued me and what kind of caused the shift in mindset for me wasn't the David Hockney painting you see there, uh, but was this painting here by Barnett Newman, an American abstract expressionist artist who uh, made work between the 40s and the, the end of the 60s, and who in 1951 painted this painting called Adam. There wasn't much to it, stripes of red and brown, and yet I could see it was very serious that he took it very seriously, that the Tate Gallery took it very seriously and had bought it and put it in the exhibition. And it was called Adam. And I had to, it was a shift in mindset for me because I was used to thinking about Adam as a character from the Bible. You know, pictures of Adam usually showed him with Eve and a tree and a snake. And yet this was Adam for Barnett Newman, an abstract painting. And for some reason that really intrigued me. Um, and made me think about abstraction and meaning and what those two things have to do with each other. And it puzzled me. And years later, I wrote a PhD on Barnett Newman, trying to connect his titles to his thinking and his painting. And years after that, uh, I became a curator at Tate Modern, uh, responsible really for growing and exhibiting our collection of North American arts. And here's the connection to the last talk. You know, we have great works in the collection by artists like Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, you may have seen these works. Pop art by Roy Lichtenstein, Andy Warhol. These are maybe the most famous works of American art from the period of the 60s and 70s, a period that's always intrigued me. And as I was working at Tate Modern and through learning art history and studying it, I'd become very aware of a list of names of American artists. You may recognize some of these, you may not. But um, after a while, it, you know, it, would, it struck me that they all had one thing in common. Some, most were men, few were women, but they were all white. And uh, working at the Tate and building our collection, one of the pressing questions came to be, who were the African-American artists during this incredible period of the 60s and 70s, and how come the Tate didn't collect many of their works? Here are some of the names that we began to research. And through various efforts and through building uh, connections with Americans who gave us money to help us acquire work, uh, we began to acquire great works by the artists who were working in that same period of the 60s and 70s. An artist like Barclay Hendricks, this is him visiting the Tate after we exhibited the painting that we'd acquired of his. And then slightly older artists like Romare Bearden and Norman Lewis, working exactly at the same time as Warhol, Lichtenstein, uh, Jackson Pollock and Rothko, but always less famous internationally, less well known in this country. But we made these acquisitions and we bought them into the Tate collection. And as we do whenever we acquire a work for the Tate collection, we read extensively and did a lot of research. And the research revealed that these artists were writing a lot and debating with each other. And there was no coherent single idea about what an African-American artist should be doing in these two decades, the 60s and 70s, which was a time, of course, of great uh, discord and tumult in America and an important time for the African-American community with the civil rights period, the black power moment, and so on. There was no single idea about what black artists should be doing, but a debate between them. And so another shift in mindset happened, which was the question, could there be a, a, an exhibition, a temporary exhibition of loaned in works, but a temporary exhibition which really looked at this period and which looked at the debates between black American artists between the 60s and 70s. But slowly everyone was convinced and we began to work on this exhibition. And we was a team which included me, the person who came up with the idea, and a colleague called Zoe Whitley, who was the co-curator, and Priyash Mystery, and you'll see pictures of them later. And we slowly developed an idea. 
And the big question when you curate an exhibition is how to organise it and what to include. Do you organise it chronologically? Do you organise it strictly thematically? For instance, we could have done rooms devoted to Martin Luther King or to Malcolm X. Um, do you organise it randomly, by colour, alphabetically? There's many ways that you could organise an exhibition. But what we decided to do was to organise the exhibition according to artist groups and to key questions that artists were asking, always privileging artists. So that meant that when it came to exhibiting the work, we wanted to keep out the archival material, the documentary footage, and so on, and really make sure that, like any other exhibition at the Tate, all the work on the walls would look absolutely fantastic. Uh, and we wanted to get a sense of the groups of different artists, of different African-American artists, but also of the disagreements between, between them. Um, this isn't the greatest slide, but this is what you would have seen in the first room uh, where we explained to our audience the key ideas behind the exhibition. Uh, so that we were celebrating the work of black artists during this period, and we were asked, looking at the question, how should an artist respond to political and cultural changes? Was there a black art or a black aesthetic? Should an artist create legible images, pictures of things, or could they make abstract work? Um, uh, was there a choice to be made between addressing a specifically black audience, or did artists hope to address a universal one? Where should they put their art and so on? Should it be in museums or on the streets? And those were the key, um, the key ways that we organized the show and the key questions we asked at the beginning. This was the entrance wall to the exhibition. And just outside the exhibition, we had some videos, but that, those were videos of leaders like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. But once you got into the exhibition, all you saw was art. And I'll walk you through the exhibition. There were 12 rooms. You can just about see behind me the, the path that people took through the exhibition. As you came into the exhibition, you walked in on a first room that was devoted to an artist group that formed together in 1963 called Spiral. And that was the first artist group during this period to really pose the question in, in what their language was at the time, is there a Negro aesthetic? The word Negro was proudly used by what we now call African-American artists at that point. No one answer was given. Uh, Norman Lewis, whose work, black and white work you see there, would make abstract paintings, but Romare Bearden uh, would make collages. And that was an introduction to the exhibition, an artist-run space, an artist-run group, with different artists posing different questions. The next uh, room looked at a different idea about artists who wanted to place their work on the streets. They weren't interested in showing their work in galleries or getting into museums, but directly addressing their audiences. It looked at Emery Douglas's work for the Black Panther newspaper, and it looked at murals that went up in Chicago and different cities, murals that were always depictive, but some of them that were abstract. Later, in room three, we looked at a question. Not a group of artists, but a question, which was how do artists respond to the black power moment? That was a moment where some black American leaders grew impatient with Martin Luther King's dreams of uh, civil rights and equality and decided to take power. And artists began to picture race riots. They began to think about um, atrocities visited on, on African-American leaders, uh, such as a, a leader of the Black Panthers who was shot in Chicago by police shooting through his door. Dana Chandler made a door that was a sort of replica of the door that uh, this, this person was shot through. The next room moved location and looked at a group of artists working in Los Angeles. What they had in common uh, was uh, the way of assembling their work from found objects. Uh, and there were four artists in that room, and you could really sense a different aesthetic as you walked from one room into the next. The next room looked completely different and was devoted to a group of artists working in Chicago, a group called the Afri-Cobra Artists, artists who were hardly heard about in the States. I mean, they were well heard about in Chicago, but you know, we had colleagues come over from New York and LA who didn't know these artists, and they certainly never exhibited their work in London. It was vibrant, it was colourful, and they wrote a manifesto for how their art should look. 
In the next room, we went back to Los Angeles and looked at three artists who chose to make uh, pictures, a recognizable work, but in different ways. One of the greatest was David Hammonds, who in the late 1960s would coat his whole body in grease and print it onto paper, so to leave a trace of his body and create an image with what he called body printing. Then we walked into a room which looked back at New York and to a group of abstract artists who didn't make pictures, but who were absolutely committed to thinking about what it meant to be black at this moment. And then into a room of photography, the great photographer Roy de Carava, who wanted to figure out if there could be a black aesthetic in photography. And he wasn't just making pictures of civil rights marches, but was thinking about the use of black and white in his photographs and really achieving incredible tones. And then we walked into a room called Black Heroes. This wasn't an artist group, but a question. A bit question, a bit like the question, how to figure black power. In this case, how to make a picture of the black hero. We included Andy Warhol here, his painting of Muhammad Ali at the back. But really, the prime position was given to Barclay Hendricks, that artist I showed you before, whose work had entered the collection. A little later on, we got into another room about abstract painting, really adventurous improvisational work uh, and works by artists like Frank Bowling and Jack Whitten. And then a solo room devoted to the Los Angeles arted, artist Betty Saar, who in the early 70s began to research other cultures, not just African-American cultures, but Haitian cultures, uh, Indian cultures, and so on, and to create shrine-like objects and create an installation like what you see here. Finally, we returned to New York and looked at a group of artists who were associated with a private gallery called Just Above Midtown and who uh, turned to using materials from everyday life like chicken bones or greasy bags. And that was how the show looked. And at the beginning of the show, we received visits from many of the artists who are still alive. And it was a fantastic opening. And we were very pleased with ourselves. But the question became, the next question became, how do we market the exhibition? And once again, this involved a sort of change of mindset. This is how we normally market Tate exhibitions. You'll have seen these as you go through London, here at Camden Town, a billboard using a picture of that Barclay Hendricks painting. But it became clear uh, after a while that it was better to let others market the exhibition for us. Now, typically, people aren't allowed to take photographs when they visit Tate exhibitions. And we uh, looked at who was coming to the show, and we realized we had to get rid of that rule. And we had to allow people to take photographs and use Instagram. After a while, we got permission to do this. And therefore, you know, the, the exhibition became marketed by everyone who visited it. Um, many people posting on Instagram all the time. It was an effort, but it was fantastically well worth it. So people came and we could also see how they were enjoying the exhibition, what they were commenting on, whether they were taking their kids, what they were saying about the exhibition as a learning opportunity. Um, and, uh, and then we could see that actually we could use this even more interestingly. And we began to make a list of all the cool people who would be in London last summer. And we got in touch with people who knew them. And then we brought them to see the exhibition. It wasn't by accident that Jay-Z came to see the exhibition. It was by communicating with people that we knew, knew Jay-Z. But this had a great effect. So when we invited John Legend to see the exhibition, he, we encouraged him to, but he Instagrammed about it. And then people you know, saw his Instagram and came to see the show and would say, post saying, I'm standing where John Legend's standing. He saw this painting. I'm seeing this painting. And this is Naomi Harris that you'll know from Moonlight and from the Bond films. And here's Zoe and Priyash, my co-curators, and they're with Will Smith when he came to visit. So there was a great, great buzz around the show that we were really, really happy about. We also had to change our mindset about how to begin the exhibition. Instead of an academic conference, we invited Spike Lee. When Spike Lee came for the opening and gave a talk with our director, Maria Bauschel. Here he is promoting the catalogue that we published. And it was wonderful to have him there. Another shift in mindset involved music. We were aware at the beginning of the exhibition that many people in our potential audience would know the music of this period. You know, I grew up listening to James Brown, Aretha Franklin, John Coltrane, Sun Ra, Stevie Wonder, and so on. 
there was some times that people thought, well, we should play this music within the exhibition, but we decided a different option, uh, and it was a change of mindset. It involved, first of all, going to meet Stuart Baker, who runs my, my favorite record shop in London, Soul Jazz Records, who was persuaded to make a compilation to accompany the exhibition. Uh, and it was sold in various shops. And one of the great things about this was that gave us more promotion. Lots of radio DJs, Giles Peterson, for instance, uh, knew Stuart and knew his record label, so gave us airtime to talk about Soul of a Nation because of this collaboration and because of uh, the fact that we had this record out. It's fantastic, by the way, uh, and, and still very much for sale. We also teamed up with Spotify and we created a playlist allowing people to download it as they walked through the exhibition or to download it once they got home. And they were, it was streamed very, very well. And then we decided to hold a couple of events inside the exhibition. So here is Stuart Baker, here's the DJ Norman Jay. Uh, not f uh, just, uh, you know, on certain Monday nights we would uh, have closed sessions where people could come in and listen to the music of the exhibition from, uh, from within the exhibition. We did a film program and we did many, many visits. Here's a visit with a great group called Creative Access, which is set up to get people from BAME communities to work in the arts. This is Zoe doing a, a trip with school kids. And this is a royal visit from one of the Obas of Nigeria. And here we have um, the slide that's my final slide. Uh, it's the last hour of the exhibition uh, and queues and queues of people coming in for that last hour. And it felt just so fantastic to have been able to present the material to many people in London, many people who came to London to see it, and for whom this exhibition created a shift in mindset for them just as it had for the Tate. So thank you very much. <laughs>